Oh man, it is finally good to be here. Solo, you know, this is the way I always envisioned the podcast. And uh, because it initially was called Smart, and then when I added uh, Sean and Jason, I had to add the less. And that was a, it was a whole thing. And they, their whole thing is like, no, less is more. And I'm like, no, man, less is less. Anyway, welcome to Smart. <sighs> less. Smart. Less. Oh, where'd you go, Sean? Oh, so I went to go visit Will, and then I went on vacation with you, Jason. With me? When? Yes. <laughs> oh, no, Jason. My memory's not so good. Oh, Jay. Believe me. Mm -hmm. Jay, did you switch gummies? Not related, but did you switch gummies recently? Yeah, this one says uh, memory <laughs> suck on it. Um, I got a deal. Uh, <laughs> Wait, by the way, by the way, speaking of memory suck, Sean, I, I don't know why it's not related, but I texted Jason last night or the night before, I can't remember. Alone on Discovery, that show about people being stuck out in the woods. Have yeah, you seen man. it? No, Sean? I want to see that. Jason's been trying to get me to watch it, or both of us, for a year at least. At least. I oh, can't. yeah, it's Jason, you told me about that. Yeah, I remember that. Dude. Is it so good? Yeah. Okay. Right? I, I mean, and it's, it's kind of so... it's kind of cinematic too, right? It like Dude. it gets all dark and creepy, and the sounds and the little what is it like? Naked front? and afraid, or no, naked and afraid looks like a kind of like the difference, kind of like Survivor. It's kind of grab assy and you know, yeah. kind of high jinxy. Yeah, that was me last night. Naked and afraid. Naked and afraid, you know? playing a lot of grab. Well, ass. I locked my keys. <laughs> I locked. I left my keys in the house, <laughs> and I thought everybody was skinny dipping. And then, but anyway, <laughs> the, the, the point is, <laughs> this is people. That, Sean, they take 10 people, put them in the woods, and whoever can last the longest with literally like a thing to, to not even a match. God, all I would think about is Blair Witch. And, I know, well, and there are people hilariously who are like, man, I'm going to give this bear a run for its money, and then oh. and then the guy doesn't even make it. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> they're all wait. professional survivalists, too. Wait, but dude, dude, if they're getting chased by a bear, is like somebody from the crew step in and... There is no crew. There's no crew. You got a they bunch of GoPros. You have yeah. a bunch of GoPros you have to You're set up. You're joking me. No. I got I to watch this. It's pretty great. That's it's incredible. pretty great. I can't wait till you get to the oh, wait two man a second. Teams, you're thinking Willie. bears. You're not. I'm not talking about Bear, gay like bears. Scotty. I'm not talking <laughs> about Scotty. No, no, no. no, 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 no. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's not, it's not just dudes. fuzzy, oh, so it's not heavy bears dudes. chasing me. No, they, don't, they haven't shot it inside rawhide at 21st and eighth. <laughs> 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 okay, listen, speaking of 21st and 8th, which makes, takes me to New York, this is a segue uh, beyond all segues. Yeah. Guys, can I tell you something? I am really excited because I don't know this person. Uh, we, we have had a passing hello, I think, a few times over the years. Uh, but he's one of those people that I've always, I'm going to say it, I've always absolutely adored his career and what he does. Is he a bear? <laughs> no, he I is. Mean. No, 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 he's not. Uh, he is just talented uh, from the get. He's been doing it a long time, and he's about all of our age. But he's mm. been doing it, and we've all been admiring him for a really long time. Not only has he been making movies and then <sighs> directing movies and then writing movies and writing plays and writing books and then going what? back and doing this and that. He's been doing it a really long time. I can tell you respect this guy. Like, you know, Will gets yeah. a certain look yeah. on his face. And yeah. there's a certain... He's, I do. Listen, listen, mystery guest, before I meet you, just know he's that... not so jokey. Will, Will actually is not phoning this one in. He, no. you've got You've got something on it's him. It's true. He um, does. He does. He's, and he's I, impressed. I just, I've always been like, oh, man, that's... Oh, that was so good. And everything he's done, he's really good. And he's done stuff that's been so... Can't wait. ...different from, from where he started to where he is today. It's just... He's always mixed it up. And I think that that's the hallmark of somebody who's really curious and really talented that they keep trying to do different stuff. I mentioned the books and the plays. And, you know, I mean, this guy, this guy, he, he, he verged on cannibalism in one of his movies. He, he stood on top of his desk in another one of his movies. Of um, he was uh, trying to get to space, but he, could, he didn't have the right uh, DNA in another one of his, mo his movies. What? He's right. now got, uh, he, he's, he's been doing this, he's doing this new series over on, uh, um, I guess on Disney Plus that's out right now. He's doing a film on Netflix. He's got, most importantly, a new documentary that he directed that is about Paul Newman joining. Ethan Hawk. Woodward. It's Ethan Hawk. What? You guys. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Ethan Hawk. Hey, guys. Oh my God. <laughs> Good morning. Wait, Ethan, I just watched The Black Phone. Is that what it's called? 
That's what it's called. You got it, it right. So, I just watched it last. It's, I've been telling everybody about it. You're amazing in that movie. Well, thanks. Yeah, I love that movie. I want to see it. I'm glad I got a legit intro from Will. I, I feel honored. <laughs> you got a legit smile out of Sean Hayes, who's usually faking it most of the time. <laughs> Smiles come easy to him, but that's genuine. Yeah. <laughs> wow, it's such a pleasure and honor to meet it, you. It really is. I mean, Ethan, we've never really met. We I don't know if you remember. We one time ran into each other on the street in the West Village. You probably don't remember. At Rawhide? Yeah, Rawhide. Or At you Rawhide. Guys scoring, Do you remember? Yeah, you did. Dime bags. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we were, I was, who were you wink, with? Wink, wink. I think you were with uh, Sherm. I, I know uh, John Sherman. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I was wearing a shirt. I was wearing a Brian Jonestown Massacre T-shirt. This is like 15 years ago, and you just went. I said, "Saying hi to Sherman," and you went, "Hey, man, nice T-shirt." And I was like, "Thanks." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was so psyched. <laughs> and Ethan, Ethan was in a tube top. A tasteful one. A tasteful one, yeah. Uh, now, I was just talking with somebody yesterday about that uh, Paul, Paul Newman documentary. I cannot wait to see oh, it. I want to see that. I just started that. Let's talk about how, how, did this, how did this happen for you, Ethan, this doc? Well, it, I was, it was like right before the pandemic started, and I was getting out of the shower in my apartment, and the phone rang. And Sean's I, got it. Sean's eyes are closed. He's got mm -hmm. it. He's yeah, got yeah, a yeah. Sean, open up your <laughs> He's eyes. He's got the picture. Go, talk slower. Talk slower. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I picked up the phone. You know how like now when the phone rings and you don't know the person's name, you should never answer it, right? Mm. You know, because it's well. Yeah. Yep. I just decided what the hell. I picked it up, and it turned out it was um, Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward's youngest child, who got my number from a friend, and she's like introduced herself and said, "I really want you to direct a documentary about my parents." Nice call. And. I, basically, my first thought was, how the hell do I get out of this? Yeah. You know? uh, um, it just sounded like so much work. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I talked to her for a while about what she had and why she thought it would be good. And, and I tried to recommend some other people. And she was like, no, I, well, I'm asking you. I was like, well, I was like, let me think about it for a minute. And I just couldn't figure out a way to say no. When I first arrived in New York, falling in love with acting, they were... I mean, not to be corny, but they had kind of a godlike status. You would see yeah. them sometimes at an opening. And the fact that they both had achieved at such a high level in such different ways. You know, she was kind of like the actor's actor. She was teaching acting. She was obsessed with theater and ran her own theater company. And, you know, he was a card-carrying cinema luminary. Mm -hmm. And they'd been married for 50 years. So whenever you think it can't be done the image of Paul and Joanne would be in my brain. Like, wow, you could live a good life and be a decent person and make great art and have love. So I, I basically asked the kids if by doing this, was I going to find out anything that was really revolting? <laughs> right, you, right. You know, like... I, I, you I really, liked their, your image of them. Exactly. I loved my fantasy version, and I thought, is this, a, is this remotely accurate? And they were like, yeah, it's remotely accurate. And anyway, I, I couldn't figure out a way to say no, so I said yes, and then almost three years went by. Right. <laughs> wow. You know what's so wow. crazy? That you're on here, I always think these, this kind of stuff is, is nuts. Somebody just texted me like two days ago that I'm in that. I'm in that documentary. No way. Yeah, there's like a photo of me or something that they cut to at the theater in Connecticut. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Really? Really? Wait, yeah, isn't that bizarre? And then Wait, here you, you are. Do you get a bump for that? that? Some sort of an I appearance? Know. I, I didn't yeah. Uh oh, that. I'm now all of a sudden yeah. in legal hell. Yeah. Oh, hey, can wait I talk till to you Sean for a second? gets <laughs> lawyered up. Nobody likes to litigate more than Sean Hayes. Wait, so Ethan, this is amazing. So now here you are, it's 2022, and you've just made, you spent the last three years of your life making a documentary about uh, Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. And let's re let's really rewind to <laughs> young. <laughs> yeah, nice. By oh, the way, nice. nice. So mm -hmm. now you're you're what? What's the first? What's your first acting gig? And where, where you're not from New York? I always you feel like a, such a quintessential New Yorker to me. Um, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Well, born in Austin, Texas. Uh, oh. My parents split up, and I traveled. My dad stayed in Texas, so I'd spend the summers in Texas. And my mom. How old were you when they split up? How old were you? Three. Okay. okay. Yeah. And right, we're um, not going to touch that then. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's, like, no it's, you got it's over no it pain. fast, probably. Yeah, no yeah. pain at three. No pain, no yeah. pain. Yeah. No pain, no pain. Uh, the, the, my mother bounced around a lot from Atlanta to Connecticut to Vermont to Brooklyn to New Jersey. Um, hmm. So I graduated high school in Jersey. Just a series of bank robberies, or what was she running <laughs> from? Well, we'd have to ask her. Well, the truth is, she was 18 when I was born. So. Wow. 
she was trying to figure out who she was and kept changing jobs and changing yeah. her identity, so to speak. I mean, not as a bank robber, not literally right. her identity. No, but, but can you, you can imagine, I, just saying that, like, I'm 52 and I'm still trying to figure out who I am. I'm, by right. the way, all you jokes You don't play, aside, but you, you can't, you don't play a day over 35, though. Well, you can't get you. cast well, as older than yeah. I mean, just look yeah, Maybe, I mean, just maybe, a little, maybe 39. 30, maybe, I mean. Yeah, but that's a stretch. But, but, you can't no, have it's funny, kids. In in your intro, you were talking about you were saying nice things about me about curiosity and things like but i feel that way too the whole time i was making this documentary i kept saying to the editor i'm not a documentary filmmaker i don't know what to do i mean i i i, I, I didn't know how to do this yeah. and i do enjoy doing that putting yourself in a position where you have that beginner's mind sensibility yeah yeah do you feel closer to it now you know I, I, there's only one thing i feel close to which is acting that's the only thing I know anything about. Uh, the other, you know, writing, doing other things, it's a similar exercise. It's just storytelling, right? Yeah, but yeah. I but I don't, no, I don't feel closer to it. I, it feels just as mysterious as it You've did. You've done some directing, though, haven't you? Yeah, a bunch. Yeah. And and, and that, that, that you feel a closer pull to acting than directing, yeah? Well, the great thing about directing is you get to choose your material and you get to hire people. Mm -hmm. So everybody that you're working with are people that you like to be around. As if, when, when you're an actor, you often get set on these sets where you're like, why is this guy such an asshole? And why is she, <laughs> who hired her? You know, uh -huh. I mean, and, exactly. and, and, or, or you get into a situation where you really like the character or something, but the director envisioned it completely different and your imaginations are like at war with each other. And, yeah. and that doesn't happen when you're directing. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just gonna say, so, what, what, but it, it strikes me. So, again, like you get to go and you and, and you you're directing some and directing a documentary, some, all because probably be, a lot of it because of you've been so good uh, at acting for so long. And again, this has happened a couple times on the show, but you and Jason are similar in that you guys started young and you've continued and, and done great stuff. And mm -hmm. they always used to sort of the, the dangers of being a child actor and blah, blah, blah. Both you guys kind of sidestepped a lot of that and stayed true to, and have continued and have, everything you do keeps getting better. And it's, and it's unusual. And that's not even a question. That's more of a statement or an observation, but what was that moment? Cause I wanted to go back before. What was, what was the first thing you auditioned for? I mean, do you remember, was it, were, were you saying to your mom, I need to audition for this? Or was she like, there's a part available? Or? Yeah. Did you pursue it? Well, all right. I'll tell you, I'll try to do it fast. Jason, I'm sure you have your story about, you know, child acting is dangerous. A lot of the people that <laughs> we came up with are dead. You know? Yeah. I mean, and there's not a bunch of them that have, that are, that are still making a living. I mean, I, I I don't say that to brag. I'm just I'm so I'm so proud of of us of of anyone that can somehow uh, uh, um, navigate that that transition from kid to young adult to what like because it's so fickle and it's it's not about who's good. It's just who can kind of stay like kind of semi cool to hire. I don't mean to sound like a cynic, but uh, you know, oftentimes it doesn't have to, anything to do with talent. I think. Well, it it has to do with. I don't think it has to do with talent. It does have to do with a little bit of your DNA, uh, who brought you up, your ability to handle failure, yeah. um, your ability to grow from failure. You know, I saw, uh, I talked to Martha Plimpton the other day on the phone, and oh, she's yeah. just grown up to be such a remarkable human being. Yeah, she's great. But if you don't do the stuff on the inside, your talent dies. Yeah. You, you yeah. know, yeah. It, or, or it just gets, it gets beaten up. My first, my mom, I didn't have a winter sport. My mom didn't get home from work till seven, so she needed me to do, you know, I needed to be doing something in the winter. So she signed me up for an acting class at the Paul Robeson Center for Performing Arts in Princeton, New Jersey. And I went to this class, and they had a guest speaker come who did like a little improv thing. And I really, I was a giant ham as a kid. And um, after class, he came up to me in the parking lot, and he said, would you like to be, he was running the McCarter Theater in Princeton. And he said, would you like to be in a play? I was like, sure. And I was <laughs> Dunois pay, you know, I carried a spear and a I was, you know, in George Bernard Shaw's St. Joan. But I did this play and I just couldn't believe being around all these adults who were having so much fun. Yeah. They were sitting there talking about God and love and sword fighting and you know, all this they were having so much more fun than my parents were. 
I mean, they, they seem to be, <laughs> I loved watching these people in rehearsal. And so after the play was over, I heard through a friend of mine about some open casting calls in New York. And I just started riding the train into New York with this other kid and going on to some of the big casting calls. And one of them was Explorers. How old were you when you were just let go to go on your own on a train into New York? 13. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, a lot of, I should say, a lot of my friends' parents wouldn't let them sleep over at my house because they thought my mother was too lenient. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, was she? Was she? Oh, yeah. I mean, I went to New York. By, I mean, I went to, I went to Europe by myself and rode the Eurail when I was 16. You know, wow. the summer. No way. Yeah, she, she put a high value on independence. Mm -hmm. And I think if she had had a different kid, I would have been in drug rehab or dead by 18. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but for some reason, it suited me. I really liked my independence. Well, you were lucky enough to find the thing that brought you joy at such a young age, which I think is key yeah. to success. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Again, unusual. Not a lot of people yeah, get unusual. that. Yeah, unusual. So Explorers is the first, your first film, is that it? First big gig, yeah. Yeah, and who, who, who that was it? With River Phoenix, directed by Joe Dante. Yeah. Wow. Wow, yeah, it was River yeah. Phoenix. Is, yeah. is, is, is Dead Poets the thing that kind of broke you, like, into another oh, uh, category? Uh, you mean broke, like, not like killed me, but no, like, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Meant, like, broke your, like, you broke into the business. Yeah, definitely. Way. The success of that movie gave me a career. Yeah, right? that's amazing. It's such a great film. You're um, so t so t talk about why you're not, uh, you know, a, a drug addict robbing liquor stores and, and doing all that <laughs> stuff, even though you were brought up in, in you know, kind of a, a permissive house, it sounds like, uh, in, in a good way. You were given rope to... Like you were trusted till you gave your mom a reason not to, and and you just ended up being okay. Now, can you take some credit yourself that you just kind of came out with a with a with a good head on your shoulders and thank God um, for that? I, I just think it's a dance, isn't it? You know, I think yeah. a lot of us with the wrong parents could be in a really bad situation. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. What leaps to my mind when you ask me that is I think about my oldest, Maya. She's acting. She's on Stranger Things right now. Oh, yeah. cool. And Wait, your daughter's on Stranger Things? Yeah. Yeah. Which one is she? She plays Robin. Get out. you got to be kidding me. No, man. I had no idea that was your daughter. She's fantastic. Sean, yeah. he's not kidding you. For fuck's sake, just <laughs> take it. Is this an honest interview, and That's so Sean. cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, so she's, she's a remarkable young woman, and I did some things right and I did some things wrong and who she is is the person who is able to differentiate right, right. and make sense out of her own life and but did you give her that did you give her that tool I mean well, the answer probably is no I mean she's just I, I kind of think she was born with it yeah exactly yeah, yeah. she's you weren't going to stop her I remember I remember her at four years old being pretty sure that she was going to be an artist. I mean, it was mm -hmm. just the way she related to watercoloring. You'd show her a, a photograph and she would change the composition of it. And if you read her a poem and she liked it, she would memorize it. I mean, she just anything that touched mm -hmm. the arts was a part of her. Mm -hmm. And and I didn't, did I give her that? I, I mean, here's an example for you about why it's a dance is we were having a hard time. I hope she doesn't mind me saying this. And she's in her early adolescence. And I just decided, all right, you know, we need to spend some time together. And I said, I had a, I had a week off and it was actually kind of funny. I actually wrote on the calendar that a movie was starting like on the 23rd of March. And I was just wrong. It was starting the 30th. <laughs> so I thought I was supposed to leave town. And all of a sudden I was like, geez, I have a whole week with nothing to do. And I went to her and I said, listen, I know you're having a hard time with me. And I'm getting on your nerves and everything, but I think the answer <laughs> is, let's go, I want to spend a week with you. Like, I've got nothing to do for a week, and nice. I talked to your mom, and I'm going to take you out of school, and we're just going to go be together for a week. And I said, I'll take you anywhere you want to go. Wow. You know? And I was sure she'd say Paris or something. You know, I didn't know. First of all, what was the reaction to, I'm going to take you out of school, we're going to spend a week together? I don't think she liked spending a week with me, but she liked getting out of school. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it was... Uh, yeah, yeah. But she said she said she wanted to go see Graceland. Wow. Which just huh. completely shocked me. I was like, wow. why do you want to go to Graceland? She's like, I don't know, but she'd been watching Elvis videos on YouTube, you know? Mm -hmm. And she just loved him. 
And uh, so I took her to Graceland and we walked into Sun Studios and she said, Dad, look. And she showed me her arm and all the hair on her arm was standing up, you know, like that thing where you get shivers. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, do you feel it? Do you feel this room? And I remember thinking, I don't know if that's this room or her. Like, the room is magical, but you have to have an awareness of why it's magical for your hair. Like, she understood what Sun Studios meant. Mm. And she was, and she cared about it and was interested in it. She understood what Sam Phillips was up to. And yeah, she understood a lot of that because I talked about it, but you, I talk about the Dallas Cowboys too, and she doesn't care about that. Right. You know, so it's, <laughs> you know, these kids are who they are and they're influenced by us. Yeah. 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 And now a word from our sponsor. Smartless listeners, we get support from ZipRecruiter. Hiring is challenging, especially right now when you have so much on your plate. Luckily, there's one place you can go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart. A place where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. That place is ZipRecruiter.com slash smartless. ZipRecruiter uses its powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. You can eat! Easily review these recommended it's candidates and invite your top choices to apply. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. No wonder ZipRecruiter is the number one rated hiring site based on G2 satisfaction ratings as of January 1st, 2022. Listen, right now, okay, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. Our listeners can go to ZipRecruiter.com slash smartless. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash, I'm going to spell it for you, S-M-A-R-T-L-E-S-S. ZipRecruiter.com slash smartless. ZipRecruiter, it's the smartest way to hire. We get support from Solo Stove. Strong, strong support. Yes. Listen, uh, I, we, we need to talk to you about how uh, how cooler weather is. Yeah, it's coming, right around the corner. Okay? I mean, it's finally time to truly enjoy the outdoors. I personally would much rather freeze than sweat. I love the cool outdoors. Give me snow before mm-hmm. sun. I don't want a beaded sweat on my face. I want a nice cool breeze. Summer may get all the excitement, but nothing beats the great outdoors during the fall. Or the winter. I mean, listen, make the most of your outdoor time this season with Solo Stove's smokeless portable fire pits that are easy to set up and clean. I like mine. It's in the backyard. We put, we make s'mores. We put the, we got the graham crackers. We got the chocolate. We got the, the the marshmallows all ready to go. We use it to do that. It's super easy. No fuss, no muss. It's the greatest thing. And it's such a smarter way to go having it outdoors and indoors, Sean. Good for you. Good for you and Scotty. Yeah, no more doing it over the stove inside. Listen, upgrade your backyard with a solo stove fire pit, all right? And create a story-worthy moment without the fireside fumes, P-U. y'all. you Stainless steel construction designed to regulate airflow and burn more efficiently. Sean, it's so little smoke, you're going to wonder why there's so much fire. Oh, well, Jason, it's the perfect catalyst for getting outside and spending more time with family and friends. Build lasting memories around a solo stove fire pit. Hey guys, prepare for your best outdoor memories yet and save big during the Solo Stove Fall event. Plus, use promo code SMARTLESS at solostove.com for an extra $10 off. That's solostove.com, promo code SMARTLESS for $10 off on top of the fall event deals. Hurry, the fall event ends November 10th. Listener, Viore Clothing gives us support. If you're tired of traditional old workout gear, you gotta check out Viore. Their product is incredibly versatile. It can be used for just about any activity like, Sean? What? Give us a few. Running. Yep. Training. Yep. Swimming. Yep. Yoga. What else is it good for? It's also great for lounging or, I don't know, weekend errands. (laughs) Everything they make is designed to look great in everyday life outside the gym. When do you wear yours? Where do you go when you wear yours? Well, I wear it in the gym And then I can wear it out of the gym, too, without looking like I just left the gym. Where are you going after the gym? Well, sometimes after I finish working out at the gym, I'll go ahead and I'll leave the gym. I'll walk across the street to my car. I'll get in that car. I'll drive it home. I will park it and then walk into my home. Oh, so you're just going from the gym to the home. How nice is that? Sometimes, but hey, you want to know what? Sometimes I got to run some errands. And I don't need to worry about what I'm wearing because what I was wearing at the gym, these Viore clothes... 
they look great if I'm just running errands or driving my car home, parking it, and then walking into the house. That's right. Why start now, Warren? They're incredible. Viore is 100% offsetting their carbon footprint, just so you know. They are also reducing and offsetting 100% of their plastic footprint from 2019 and beyond. They're utilizing better sustainable materials for their products, empowering your best active life. Feel good about the things you buy and also how they're made and how you look. Viore is an investment in your happiness. For our listeners, they're offering 20% off your first purchase. Get yourself some of the most comfortable and versatile clothing on the planet at viore.com slash smartless. That's V-U-O-R-I dot com slash smartless. Not only will you receive 20% off your first purchase, but you'll enjoy free shipping on any U.S. order over $75 and free returns. Go to viore.com slash smartless and discover the versatility of Viore clothing. Do you like how I brought it in there for a landing at the end? And now, back to the show. I want to go back to when you were starting out because a, a, a question jumped in my head about uh, dry spells. Like, you know, when you're starting out as an actor, you said you did this play and it goes, that was kind of amazing and thrilling being around all those adults. And then I think in people's minds, uh, people who are as successful as you, other people think, oh, it's just snowballed and it was great and I never stopped working. But there are always dry spells for actors, especially when you're starting out and you're younger. How do you get through those? Did you doubt yourself? How did you get through that doubt? And were you ever like, God, I'm, I can't find a job. Maybe this isn't working. Maybe I chose the wrong thing. You know, I, I say this a lot and people think I'm kidding when I say it, which I guess is a compliment or something, but I've definitely was certain I was washed up at three different times. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, yeah. there, there were three different chapters of my life where I was like, oh, wow, it's over. Like, I didn't, I didn't know it was going to end. Um, because when you, when you have success young, it hijacks your brain in a kind of negative way, which is that you kind of think, oh, yeah. the world's on my side. Yeah. You know, like, oh, I got this. I was in Dead Poets Society when I was 18. Like, that's my break. Now I'm a made man. And then all of a sudden, four years go by, and you do six other movies, and they're all failures. And then you want to audition for some happening movie, and nobody w even wants to let you audition because they've heard of you, and they know they don't like you. Mm -hmm. right. you know, you, right. th th there's all these other 24-year-olds that are just graduating college and now they're finding themselves. They're coming out of the, you know, they just graduated from this drama program and everybody's really excited about them, right? And they're like, no, we don't want that kid from Dead Poet Society. I saw that terrible mystery date. He's awful. Uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I, remember, I remember overhearing some um, film exec, like, like, like it was, I was in the bathroom and it was like a president of, Paramount or something, and and he was like, yeah, uh, America cast its vote for Ethan Hawke, and he's not a movie star. He'll never make it. Oh, and I, I remember going, like, oh my! It was that after a premiere of some movie I did. I was like, oh my god! Christ. And you come rushing out and go, where? What did they? Where's the tallies? Where no, I, I I hid inside there. <laughs> yeah, of course. Pe people talk like that all the time. They they love to write people off. You know, they're either building you up or tearing you down. Yeah, you're you're right, either yeah. in the process of one of them. And I've had three different times where I really was scared and uh, because I love it. I love doing it. And the, I think the joke is that it's how you handle those moments when, because yeah. we're all constantly being asked to transition. You know, even, yeah. you know, now my beard's going gray and, you know, I, I have to transition as an actor. I have to become a different actor. Right. Um, and if you try to stay the same person you were 10 years ago, you try to stick yourself in formaldehyde because people liked you then, yeah. you, you just die. You have to change and you have to be willing to let it all go, I, I think. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, you end up being wrong for the part if you keep, if you stay in the same spot. Yeah, if you stay yeah. in the same spot. And how much, how much, Ethan, did you, so you, what year was it that you started Malapart, your theater company? That was in the early 90s. Early 90s. 91. And where is that, Ethan? It was the theater company, the, Right after, you know, it was a couple of years after Dead Poet Society, and I had dropped out of college. And uh, what city? But what city is it in? Right New now? York City. We, York. I, I, I took some of the money I made and just rented a theater on Forty Second Street, and oh, wow. I had a lot of brilliant friends: Josh Charles, Robert Sean Leonard, Jonathan Mark Sherman, Steve Zahn, um, a bunch of 
different men and women that were young artists, and we just decided to dedicate ourselves to producing young people's work, you know, mm. uh, the work of our own generation. And we put on these little plays. It was, it was, a, it was a real sensation, and, and I can tell you, as an actor who'd moved to New York in 1990 from Toronto, and I didn't know a single person, it was very intimidating because you guys had that... I knew some of the people in Naked Angels. You guys were kind of the answer to Naked Angels. You were like the next generation. And you had all these great guys um, and, and doing all this amazing stuff. But I was thinking that must have given you quite a bit of, I was going to say respite, but at least something that you could get to sort of take your mind away from all the politics and the bullshit about being a movie star and actually just focus on doing your thing. Is, that, is there any truth to that? You know, Jason, I wonder what you would say. When we were talking about surviving being a young actor... What actually popped through my head is I, my friends. I had really good friends. Mm. Yeah, and jo Josh is a good choice for that. He's such a good dude. Hello to Josh. He's you such a, but when, when you have good friends who say to you, you sound really stuck up. Yeah. Mm. Oh, you've been, you know, you, what, you've been hanging out with your agent too long. You sound mm -hmm. like you're on an interview. And you have friends that you admire the way that they think about art or the way that they... Mm. I think that your friends can save your life. And if you don't have the right friends, I know like I, sometimes I just feel so lucky that uh, about the friends that I made that they're the ones who kept me alive and kept me thinking. A amen to that. And also crossing paths with people that are behaving in a way that you recognize as a way that you don't want to be. Um, mm -hmm. That's also really important. Yeah, actually, you know, you know what? I'm glad you said that because, uh, Jason, you sound really stuck up. Oh, well, um, yeah. me, um, are we still rolling? Let me go yeah. next. Yeah. Uh, no, but, you know, I'll, you know, Ethan, I was thinking one of your friends that I knew, I know a lot of those guys uh, from way back in the day, but one of the guys was uh, uh, Josh Hamilton. I remember, do you remember when he did, because uh, I was living with, uh, Missy Yeager was my girlfriend at the time when they did wow. This Is Our Youth. Yeah, with Kenny yeah. and Morgan yeah. and with Ruffalo. And uh, Josh was so brilliant in that, man. He was so so fucking good. It just made me think of 42nd Street. Yeah, exactly. I, I did, Missy did a play with me at, uh, at Malapart. Yes, yeah. that's right. Missy yeah. did a play with you. Ethan, yeah. you know, I always, I, I ask a bunch of people who come on this show who are in the theater, if you have any great, like, tragic but funny theater stories that happen to you, uh, like, one night. I'll share, I have one I don't think I've shared with you guys. Um, one night, uh, just did this play, it's called Goodnight Oscar in Chicago. Hopefully it's going to New York. And, um, we're definitely inserting applause there, by the way. Yeah, that'll be. It. <laughs> and in the middle of the, in the middle of, at, towards the end of the play, I have to play the piano every night. It's part of the story. And in the front row, there's two girls that were bombed, wasted, out of their mind, drunk. And uh, while I'm playing, it's a really intimate, like, kind of moment in the play. And these girls, every time I just like, I would play like every ten seconds, they'd go. <laughs> Way to go! Whoa, look at that! And it was like the rest of the audience was completely silent, and the guys would come down and they try to get on the stage. It was cr insanity. You were doing this play in a theater there in Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. Yes, they were in the front row, bombed. Wait, it was so. Yeah, it was I, so. I have a. I have a lot of good theater stories, man. I'm trying to, I'll, I'll go with the front row. I did a play called Hurley Burley with Josh Hamilton, Bobby Cannavale, Parker oh, Posey. Yeah. Oh, Bobby a Cannavale. Of, uh, a, a lot of great people. But the director had this idea that my character was kind of a drug addict, a ne'er-do-well type, that, that I should be on the stage passed out as the audience enters, mm -hmm. right? So at the... 20 minutes, when the doors opened, I would have to be, and I'd have to be in my underwear. It was supposed to be like hanging off my butt. And I'm just in my underwear, completely collapsed on a living room couch, right? It's just supposed to be bombed. And people would come and sit down and they would see me and it was like they were looking at their television. They would just talk about me. Yeah. <laughs> like I wasn't there. Because and, and the, the first couple of rows, I could just hear, you know, he's a really terrible person. I read this article in People Magazine where he said this <laughs> stupid thing. He's really a jerk. He's a real misogynist. And, blah, blah. and I'm like, and, and I'm having to listen. And I can't, like, I want to lift up my head and say, hey, I'm right here. Okay, yeah. that hurts my feelings. And that's yeah, not exactly. true. Exactly. Okay? And, and, Dude. 
Dude, it would be so dude, painful. Wait, Ethan, wait, Ethan, I want to just hijack for one minute, and t- and, uh, interrupting him, which is what I opened up with. I was just in town here getting a coffee with my middle son and my partner, my girl. We're getting coffee, and this woman comes by with her grandson and her son, whatever. She's standing, I'm going to say, six feet from me. And she's looking at me, but talking to her son. She goes, I don't know. I can't really remember his name, but uh, but that's him. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting having call, and I'm stuck on a bench, and she's six feet. And I, I just wanted to be like, hey, you know, I'm alive. I can, I can hear you. <laughs> I'm breathing right I'm here. Breathing. Public yeah. property. Anyway, so you're amazing. on this. By the way, who directed that version of Hurley Burley? Uh, Scott Elliott. Of course. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. And that's so funny. I had another time where my friend died on stage with me. How about that? Wait. What do you mean, lit- wow. fit, like literally? Like literally, the, a great Canadian actor, Richard Easton, we had a scene in uh, Tom Stoppard's Coast of Utopia where he had to scream at me, um, you know, I will not lend you any more money. He had this huge thing where he, and his final line was, and that's my last word. No way. And as he, as he said it, <laughs> his tongue fell out of his mouth the way like a brick would fall out. Like something was <laughs> oh so God. wrong. What? And then, oh he, then he hit the ground like, uh, you know, I mean. Face first. Face first. And, yeah. and I was so frozen. I could, I'm staring. And I, I knew, commitment I literally to the just performance. Went, yeah. You know, the audience <laughs> thought that that was part of the play, right? Sure. Because it kind of seemed like my final word. And then he croaks. <laughs> yeah. And I'm standing there. And I don't know what's, I'm looking at the audience and they're all laughing. And I just, my brain just went to the dark side. I was like, he's dead. He's, I mean, that guy, that guy is dead. My friend wow. Richard is dead. What? Right. And I don't know no. what to do. And Martha Plimpton was in the wings and she came out and she was so ballsy. She came out, she was just like, is there a doctor in the house? Is there a doctor in the house? And then some dude in the third row was like, I'm a doctor. And the rest of the audience is still laughing. Podiatrist, but I'm here. <laughs> no, he was. And then the prop guy came out and they did, um, what do you CPR? call it? CPR. CPR. They did CPR on him. And so he was dead for seven minutes and they revived him at center no stage, way. Lincoln Center. No yep, way. True story. Big applause. No, the, 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 the audience had been evacuated. There was no applause for life. That's a waste. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Wow, I'm glad we were laughing because it has a good outcome. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. He survived and he actually returned to the show about two months later. Wow. That's wow. What was it? A heart attack crazy. or something? Or? Yeah, he had, he had a full blown heart attack right there, at center yeah. stage. Wow. Oh hey, uh, Ethan, I've got a question for you. Something that uh, is, uh, I would assume, uh, is unique to uh, young young actors that that become adults. Um, something that I sort of didn't battle with or struggle with, but I remember it being a challenge. And I wonder if you had the same thing. When you start training yourself to be convincing as another person at a time when you're still trying to figure out who you are or who you're going to become, right? As a, as a child, you know, we don't really figure out who we're going to be like till we're what, 16, 17, something, whatever the hell it is. So you're trying on all these different roles and really trying to be believable. And so that's causing you to really try to find that place inside of you that's kind of like that character. It started to develop for me sort of like a, uh, a manageable form of schizophrenia, right? Like a, a monetizable <laughs> version of schizophrenia. But it, 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 it sort of confused my path to identity and who I really was when I wake up in the morning or go to bed at night. Did you ever deal with any of that st- starting as, as, as young as I did, training yourself to be somebody other than who you were organically becoming? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. you know, freaky, I mean, right? I had that, I mean, for example, when I was doing Dead Poet Society, um, my character is extremely shy, right? He's yeah. extremely, and so you're accessing the part of yourself that is right. really shy, right? Like, yeah. well, what am I like when I'm really shy? And you start, it's almost like a, oh, it sounds really corny to say, but you know, you hear those Buddhist guys say, just, if you just make yourself smile for half an hour, you actually are in a good mood and it right. does work. It's, yeah. you can kind of hardwire your brain. Mm-hmm. Well, you can hardwire your brain for a lot of different things. Right. Yeah. And if you're doing a daily meditation on why a human being might hate themselves and not feel like what their their words are worth anything, and you're accessing that part of yourself, yes, you know you're more than that, but you're, it's kind of like you're wiring your brain to highlight that part of you. Mm-hmm. And I really struggled with that. When that movie was over, and this has been an ongoing theme of my life of trying 
I think actors spend a lot of time inviting, you know, how to get into character, right? You hear yeah. people say that all the time. And so you spend all this energy inviting depression, anger, madness. It's most confusing with the darker emotions, right? Yeah. You invite them in, but then what are you supposed to do with them once you've invited them into your psyche to play? Right. And I found 100%. that I found that extremely difficult. And if you're talented, you have an aptitude for this. Right. <laughs> and and it, it's actually an aptitude for insanity. Yeah, you, right. you know, yeah, uh, for sure. And and I think the big lesson for young actors is if you're going to really think about character, it, it, you have to start to think about your own character. Well, it's you know it's so interesting you say because I'm I'm I really am obsessed with the Black Phone. I thought it was such a great movie, and uh, I'll watch it again. Like it's one of those movies I'll watch again and again. It, where you you actually I didn't know anything about it, and as I'm watching the movie, you're playing this crazy kidnapping Silence of the Lambs kind of guy, <laughs> and I didn't think you I I didn't think the character would be as dark as it is. I mean, you actually kill children. Children, yeah. Like you kill them. And I was like, how in the world do you find this person? <laughs> like, how in the world did you find out how to play that guy? Because it was scary as shit. Maybe you don't want to know, Sean. Okay, yeah, maybe maybe, don't maybe know. you just asked the wrong question, guy. Yeah, maybe you right. just fucked with yeah. the wrong guy. And she <laughs> drop your mic and pack your shit, Sean. Start running now. <laughs> Where do you live? I want to come no, over. No, 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 Sean. <laughs> and, 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 it was really scary. No, you know, I, I don't really know how to answer that question except that I feel as I get older that acting at its best is a kind of shamanistic process. And that might sound pretentious or whatever, but it is. You're the dude, like if everybody's sitting around the campfire, you like get up and you tell a story and you do a dance and, you, you, it's, and you're kind of inviting these other spirits to be a part of the story in some way. It's, yeah. it, you, you, you are a shaman that is kind of part of the job. And learning to invite different emotions in and letting them flow in and out yeah. Yeah. Makes a good storyteller. It, it, it's it, you have to know who you are, uh, and I'm lucky. What I did on that job, for example, is I just every day I get home from work, I would just go on a walk with my kids because the the dad the dad gene in me is way more powerful than the actor gene in me. Mm, yeah, you, yeah. You, you know, like, and it I know who I am in relationship to them yeah. very well. I'm their father. Mm -hmm. That's all that matters. And um, are we eating? Are we learning to tell the truth? Are we taking care of one another? All those really simple, banal things. It's kind of like a grounding wire for me. Uh, but I don't really know how to answer it. You know, yeah, it's yeah, funny. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it occurs to me, you touched on it, that you know that your character in Dead Poets Society was... Um, you know, very sort of shy. And then you had said earlier when you were you, when you first started taking acting uh, part of this theater when when you were a kid in Princeton that they that you were actually quite a ham and whatever. And I've always thought of you. I don't know you again, but I've always thought of you as a, kind of a shy guy. And I wonder if it's because of that impression. I just went around to all all three of you guys, and I was thinking like, Sean, the character that you first like sort of introduced you to the world was your character on Will and Grace, who was yeah. very kind of crazy and, and all, all over the place. And Jason, you were kind of a wise ass. I knew you from, uh, it's, it's your move before we became <laughs> friends when you did that. And you were like this wise ass. And that's maybe how you're introduced to the world is that thing. And I, a lot of people knew me just from the first thing they knew me from was probably Arrested Development where I played this insane Magician who was over the top and illusionist. Uh, thank you, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and you know, and like that that you get kind of, and I was thinking you get typecast not just for work for life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I always say that you know the thing about being an actor that nobody tells you is it robs you of the ability to make a first impression anymore. Yeah, uh -huh. Ooh. that's so interesting. You meet people and they have a first impression, right. and for some people, I don't. Yeah. There was a whole group of people when I was younger that hated me because they hated the guy from Reality Bites. You know, they think, <laughs> <laughs> Troy's a jerk. Yeah. I don't like you. You think you're so cool, you know? Yeah. And <laughs> You're like, what, man? I, I'm like, dude, I played the character, you guys. Will you relax? Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't steal Winona from Ben Stiller. Like, you don't uh -huh. have to be mad at me. Uh -huh. <laughs> dude, that's funny. But Will Ferrell used to do that. that we, if, you ever, if you go with Will, people would be like, 
Hank, Hank, and they attack him, and you end up being security for Will because people are like, we're going to party and drink and run down the street naked now, right? Yeah, yeah, and he's yeah. like, no, man, I've got fucking four kids. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Yeah. And we will be right back. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. You know, you guys get stuck focusing on a problem instead of solutions. I do all that. I, 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 do. I do that I all do the too. time. My name's Jason, and I get stuck on problems sometimes. Yes, and, and how might that situation go better with a different mindset maybe, right? You tell me how. Well, it can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem-solving mode yeah. when faced with a challenge in life. But I'll bet when you learn how to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling? Oh, amen to that. A therapist can help you become a better problem solver, yeah. making it easier to accomplish your goals no matter how big or small they are. Well, I am thinking about giving therapy a try. Should maybe better help? I mean, is that a great option, Sean? I think it's a fantastic option. Why? You know why? It's convenient. It's uh -huh. accessible. It's affordable and entirely online, Jason. What if I want to get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and switch therapists any time? They can handle that. Better help really? can do all of that. Yes. I use a therapist. It helps me all the time. It helps me problem solve when I'm feeling anxious or a little depressed or whatever. It helps me focus and kind of organize my life back in line and gets and helps me get things done. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash smartless today to get 10% off your first month. That's better, H-E-L-P.com slash smartless. And now back to the show. Hey, uh, Ethan, talk about your, talk about your relationship with, uh, with, with, with fame and success. I put in quotes because, you know, y in my opinion, y you've, you've hit the gold medal with success as far as longevity goes like that. To me, that's the, that's the tough thing to do. Like, yeah. uh, you know, all you need nowadays is just a sex tape to get your head above the titles and, <laughs> and to get a lot of money. Um, so that's, you know, to get Working fame and it. money, it's, it. it's, sex tape. uh, so yeah. So, yeah. Just anything. Will, yeah. Just me. Just some shots of me. Yeah. Sorry. I was just talking to my assistant real quick. <laughs> um, so uh, you strike me as somebody who is completely um, fulfilled with with what you do, the level that you do it. Um, you've never seemed to be a person that has had a thirst for fame fortune, recognition, celebrity. You're, you're, it, it seems that you've always been on a quest to be uh, an actor that's working and also an actor that's respected. And, and not that that is, you know, a, a contrived uh, um, agenda, but it is just a great result of the choices that you make. Um, is that something that you give a lot of thought to or is it just sort of, well, I just kind of get the roles that I get and the perception is what it is. It is not something of my making. It's not a, it's not a recipe that I've, I've got my eye on and not something that you're, you're proactive at. Well, our life is how we spend it. And so I, th I think I could easily say, oh yeah, it's no big deal, but no, I, I put a lot of thought. I, I'll give you an example. When you were saying that, I, did you guys see the new Elvis movie? No, you haven't seen it yet. Well, it's funny because Elvis is interesting to me because you know how when Tarantino makes biopics, he changes the ending? You know, like... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, yeah. I'd like to do an Elvis movie that ends right when the colonel... You know, when, when Sun Studios is exploding and Elvis is breaking, the colonel signs him up, they leave Sun Studios, he signs the biggest contract in music history with RCA. And I would make a strong case to be made that he died that day. You right. know, mm. that, that, that when the object of your life becomes about succeeding versus what you are succeeding about. Because if his goal in life was to make beautiful music, there is no doubt that he should have stayed with Sam Phillips. He, he loved African-American music. He loved what Sam Phillips was doing there. He, all his success came from singing black music. And he should have stayed there and helped other musicians and I mean, it's easy. I, I'm not, I'm using him as an example, sure, right? I'm not sure. casting judgment on the dead. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, what I'm saying is like, I think the path to longevity, like this is what I said to Maya, is like, she wants to be an actor. I'm like, okay, how do you feel if you're 63 and you're teaching acting at uh, uh, prep school in Seattle? She's like, oh, that'd be amazing. 
right? <laughs> okay, the, the second she says that, it's all going to go fine. Yeah, right. It's, it's all going to go fine. And you have to, my point about the Elvis thing is, if his goal was making music, yeah. he made the wrong decision. It doesn't matter what the price tag from RCA was. Right. You know, he would have been the biggest thing in rock and roll wherever he was. He didn't understand that he had the ball. He had the talent. Sam Phillips had the talent. They were going to change music. Music was going to change, right? That was going to happen. And he could have, he just put the, the, the cart before the horse, you know? Right. And so yeah. what I try to do with decision-making about parts and things like that is if your focus is on how it develops you as a person, mm -hmm. uh, how it develops your art, how it develops your life, then there's things... I knew, like, for example, I was making a joke about wanting to say no about the Newman Woodward documentary, but I knew that that would be good for me, right? I mean, right. These, mm -hmm. these are people that dedicated their whole life to the same thing I've tried to dedicate mine to. They did it at a much higher level for a lot longer. And here I am. I was turning 50 when I got that phone call. And it felt like, well, the universe has given me a little challenge. Like, hey, ready? Can you do this? And I yeah. knew... I, I didn't want to do it. Like, I have no desire to be like a documentarian. That's not right. my goal in life. But the universe is, I'm not in charge of everything. It's dictating it to me. It's, I knew yeah. that meditating on these two people for as long as it took would probably do good things to my life. And it definitely yeah. did. So yeah. if I'm hearing you right, it sounds like you've got a very clear idea about what what the road looks like that fulfills your, sorry for the term, your your soul creatively, spiritually, and you're letting Did you that just in, fucking say soul? Uh, I apologize. Um, <laughs> and that's informing your your decisions. Um, and that it would also seem like uh, you would probably and, and have probably lived your life in such a way where you're not creating things in your life that are at odds with your ability to follow that instinct. In other words, you don't have some a choking overhead number in your life. Like, oh my God, you know, my, my six houses and my, you know, my 17 cars mandate that I... By the way, Ethan, I... don't, don't fall for it. Jason's always trying to get to everybody's overhead number. <laughs> um, um, but... <laughs> that, that you're, that, you know, that, that, that dictates that you have to take that soul crushing starring yeah. role in something that just gives you a big paycheck and then consequently probably leads to career suicide. So you haven't set yourself up for any of those trappings even though i'm sure you live a very comfortable life it, you're you're letting you're letting your 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 other stuff dictate your career choices yes yes and and now we're back to the like nature nurture you know as you yeah. say that like my mom is a, an anti-materialist yeah. like she is she is suspect of anyone who spends too much money on an automobile or jewelry yeah. or anything, any exterior show of an accumulation of wealth or status, right? Mm -hmm. right. She's, she's allergic to it and suspicious of it immediately. That's the house I was growing up in. So if I had met the colonel, you know, if I was Elvin, <laughs> like I would, I mean, he, he's a shyster, right? right? Yeah. You, yeah. You know, and, and Elvis didn't have that in his life. I don't know why I'm talking about Elvis so much, but, right. but my point is, yes, I think that, you know, we all want to be able to have a decent roof and pay for our kids' health. You know, we all all want yeah. that. But if you're not comfortable with, like, a middle-class aesthetic and you really want 80 million pairs of shoes and stuff, you're going to get in trouble if you're not a genius. Yeah, Sean. Yeah. Yeah, Sean. Yes, Sean. Yeah. Hey, yeah, Sean. for every pair wait, wait, I buy, hang, on, I hang, hang on, I do, okay. want, I do want to say, so, Ethan, I'm, Jason, I'm glad you brought that up because it... You know, if you look at the movies that you've made, you've made over the last 30 years I mean, a lot of different films and in, in a lot of different genres. Tons of commercial movies as well as yeah, tons of commercial. Ones, yeah. yeah, tons of commercial, but also like, you know, you made, first of all, I want to talk about Gattaca. I love, I, I think yeah, a really underappreciated film. That yeah. is a great, and I've seen it probably three or four times. I I, there, I just love that, man. What was, what drew you to that? I, I've always wanted to talk about that movie. Andrew Nichol wrote, that was one of the best scripts I ever read. I mean, if, if, if we're, we haven't even been talking about great art, like sci-fi really opened up my life too. Like when I read Kurt Vonnegut as a kid, yeah, yeah, Tolkien, yeah. Uh, Philip K. Dick, you know, these things make your brain challenge society and mm -hmm. what society throws at you as truths. And Gattaca was just a staggering script. Um, and I'm so happy that you say that because, you know, when that movie came out, it, it was a failure. But over the last 20 years, it's found its audience. And I've always thought, 
Andrew Nichol is one of the, just one of the best writers I've ever come across. So so that. good. Yeah. No, I saw it in the theater, and I've seen it subsequent in, in all sorts of. When you when you are because you're so Im you're so immersed in 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 everything that you love to do the theater the film writing. What do you do to escape it if you ever need to? I know you like music, right? You're a big music guy. Yeah. You, mm -hmm. Sports, you'll follow sport. What do you like? I think one of the secret blessings of my life, I'm just a huge fan. You know, I mean, I love music. I love movies. The reason I've been able to work in so many different genres of movies, I think, is I actually really like them all. Yeah. You, you, you know, I mean, people can always tell if you're... Um, Oh, you know, if you're cashing in, they they smell they they smell it when you don't like what you're doing, and right. so I, I've, music is my secret great passion. Listening to records over and over again, finding new that. music. I'm not I have no aptitude for that art. Like I'm not good at it, so I can just geek out and be a fan and love what they do. Do you ever play anything? Yeah, I play the guitar badly. Both yeah. my my oldest two, Maya and Levon, are both actual musicians and they've lapped me so much that it's now embarrassing to play the guitar in my house because yeah. they play so well but no i love it who would you pay top dollar for a ticket to go see a concert wow besides elvis besides well if i could get elvis back from the dead that'd be really good <laughs> um there's so many people you know ethan they, hawk says he wants to get elvis back from the dead to give him advice on, <laughs> <laughs> on how to deal with the colonel um no um Hamilton Lighthouse is from the, mm -hmm. he was the lead singer of The Walkman, and he did the score for the last movie stars, the doc I just did. And he's just brilliant. I highly recommend brilliant. people buy his music. He's just underrated and oh, incredible. Um, brilliant. Brilliant, dude. The, I, I feel like we have very, a lot of similar, Ethan's like a, a lot more successful slash curious slash uh, like artistically inclined and, and gifted. Don't forget handsome. Me. And yeah. hands more handsome than me. He's just got all this. I know it's amazing. He's, he's like a way more interesting. Yeah, and he can play even and younger. He, than and I'm like probably. a ten times more interesting baby. You no, know, uh, well, no, I'm just saying that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're not going to get into. It. Um, so, so, but, but then you do. Here's the other thing I want to talk about. So you do things like Gattaca, and I don't want to belabor this too much, but it, I, I love it. And then you make these Linklater these movies with Richard Linklater. You guys have this amazing, seemingly amazing relationship. Uh, with him and with Julie Delpy and how many of those films did you guys make? Which you also wrote three, three, yeah. Which you also wrote. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that talk about a complete shift from working with Andrew Nick on doing Gattaca to doing these movies, and then you do Training Day with Denzel and Antoine Fuqua. I mean, this is these are you know you're, you're getting whiplash for with the different genres here. Uh, but it's seemingly all stuff that you're really into and can do with with ease. Well, <laughs> I would, it's it's certainly not easy, but I I don't know how to answer how to, to speak to that. That writing thing is that the writing. Th tell me the writing thing is hard. T don't tell me the writing thing is easy. Uh, isn't yeah. that like just staring at a wall trying to fill a blank page and just you're overwhelmed with all the options available to you? And how do you reduce that down and write at the level that that you're writing? I think it's really important for young actors to write because it gets um, you know, that whole thing we we're saying about character and about mm -hmm. who you are. And if you're constantly interpreting other people's words, it's extremely valuable to know what your words are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be for publication. It doesn't need to be, but just, just the ability to hear your own voice. And I, I think, Will, to answer what you were saying, my mom had this um, quote above the toilet when I was growing up, which is, if you improve in one talent, God will give you more. And the, the, the other one was to, to, to master one craft, you have to apprentice three. I have one over the toilet. It says, please be neat and wipe the seat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he does but but the, the point I'm trying to make is that for me, all these things fed each other. Like if you're sitting in a Monte Carlo for four months with Denzel Washington, working with him at a very high level, you don't unsee that, right? Mm, yeah, right. And, and you bring that with you on your next job. So when Linkletter wants me to, do this 12 year project where we're going to make a short film about growing up and I'm going to be acting with this young kid over 12 oh, years. Yeah. I can bring what I've learned from time on set with Denzel. He creates, he doesn't wait for people to create a creative atmosphere for him to work. He makes it happen. 
mm -hmm. right? Wow. He, he, and and it's and once you see that that's possible, it opens up doors. You know, getting to be in a rehearsal room with Tom Stoppard and getting to see like how he obsesses on every consonant and vowel and the way the whole thing works like a poem and seeing writing at that level, Sam Shepard, um, getting to be around these people. If you're, if you're paying attention, you bring it with you on the next job, yeah. you know? And, yeah. And I was really grateful, you know, Rick invited Julie and I to write those movies with him. And, you know, you guys saw Days of Confused, right? I mean, yeah. the, it was so exciting to be working with somebody of our generation who wasn't imitating other people. He, he was asking this question, like, what is our generation? Yeah, you know, what, 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 do, what are we contributing? How can we push the forum forward? And so, yeah, you're a student of what happened before to understand how they moved their time period, but not to imitate them, but to be present in your own generation. Dude, I fucking love that so much. I, I, I'm such a big proponent of the same. I, there's nothing for me, I always talk about it in comedy, but I, I hate anything that's, that feels too derivative. I, 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 I really rail against often to these guys about other people who I feel like are kind of not just, I don't even mean stealing somebody's bit. I mean, just kind of doing their thing. Stealing to, their attitude. Yeah. Stealing their attitude. And it bums me out on such a profound level. And, and uh, I often have to be talked off the ledge by these guys well, for being it, such it, a crank. It causes about me it. physical pain when they make money at it. And, yeah. You know, same uh, here, man. Uh, same here. It makes me <laughs> fucking crazy. I'm going to send but you if, my list. If, if you see <laughs> my, if you, one of the things I'm so proud of Maya about on this, on this rock, Robin on Stranger Things is it's, a, it's proof of this idea that you don't have to try to be original. If you are yourself, right. you will be original. That's Stop right. imitating everybody else. Stop she trying, brought yeah. herself and what she has to offer to this character. And all of a sudden, I haven't seen that character in film before. It's a unique person. Yeah. And that's and when when you see a comedian, a musician, uh, anybody bring themselves, you know, then they are original. It's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And it's inspiring. It's so yeah. exciting. Oh, man. I tell you what, Ethan, thank you so much for your... You, we, yeah, we've pal, taken up so much of your time. Thank you. Please keep staying original. Keep staying <laughs> curious. Yeah, yeah. Love watching you do what you do, man. It's such an honor uh, to You're have very, you here. very, very inspiring. Really inspiring. I'm so glad to finally speak to you and meet you. I can't yeah. believe we our paths haven't haven't crossed more significantly till I now, know. Well, I'm a big fan of you guys, and you're why I did the show. Yeah, I and I, I love the fact that you guys are... You know, the thing about being the surprise guest is you guys don't have prepared questions. You know, yeah, normally you nothing. do an interview <laughs> and you can sense exactly what the interviewer wants you to say. All right, all right. Do you remember in 1998, you yeah. told Rolling Stone magazine, <laughs> yeah, yeah. remember, remember, uh, say that again. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, no, we're just, we're just three dummies trapped in an elevator with you and we've got, yeah. we've got you trapped for an hour. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and we also, I think all of us understood when you said, you know, it's about the friendships and we're lucky that we get to do this because we're all friends and I love these guys and we get to spend a lot of time together and, yeah, and that's a lucky. blessing man you know yeah. so ethan thanks for doing thanks, this pal. it's great to yeah. hear you talk thanks for having me everybody yeah. appreciate yeah, it man. such a pleasure thank appreciate you man. your time have a good rest of the day all right you Bye, too man. guys take see care you, buddy. see ya so uh i think he might be top on the list of uh i i want to be friends with him at yeah, the end like, of like, yeah, I, yeah. I mean i want to yeah. be friends with a lot of people that we meet on the show but he might be tip top he just seems so damn great yeah yeah so cool and, he, and he, you know he's got this new uh docu-series as he talked about the what's that the last movie stars on on hbo uh yeah the last movie stars hbo max i mean uh he's just like of course of course they came to him of course the uh, Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward's kids came to him because he's just, yeah, like well. you said, he's cool. You want to hang out with him, and he's the kind of guy you'd want telling. Do you, you want know. to see that documentary just because there's a photo of me in it? Mm. Again, he didn't really react to that. Do you notice yeah. that? Because <laughs> I mean, draw. I don't think Ethan's seen it. No. Yeah, I don't think he's yeah. seen but it. But he kind of yeah. he kind of nodded, and I think that he was yeah, sort I know of. He didn't really. I think he thought. I don't like, think he's positive who you are. Sean. No. I, by the way, I don't yeah. disagree with you. It's the no. hat and the glasses. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but seriously, his his brain, his his soul, spirit, whatever you want to call it, seems just is, so... Is this the second time today you brought up soul? Soul, so, I mean, yeah. What's well, happening to you right I'm now? I'm just trying to get myself to a place where I can say his heart and everything right. just seems yeah. so bionic. <laughs> bionic! Bionic! <laughs> I don't think we've used bionic! that one. Bionic! Bionic! Smart. Smart. Less. Smart.
Tartless is 100% organic and artisanally handcrafted by Bennett Barbaco, Michael Grant Terry, and Rob Armjarf. Smart Less. Our next episode will be out in a week wherever you listen to podcasts, or you can listen to it right now early on Amazon Music, or early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app.